Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Thank you all for joining us today via Zoom for our virtual uh, fireside uh, chat with the Chief Executive Officer of the Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, His Excellency Mohammed Al Hamadi. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Your Excellency, uh, we have uh, the moral equivalent of a standing room only audience. I don't know how you do that in the virtual side, but we have a lot of interest in this conversation. And well, sh we should, because I'll come back to this, but this is a pioneer in the industry in, um, in the UAE. Uh, this is being hosted by the uh, Global Energy Center, so I also want to salute Randy Bell, the director of that center, and Jennifer Gordon and Emily Burlinghouse uh, from his energy team. This really is one of the best operations in global, global energy anywhere. And we, uh, we're proud to have worked with you over time, Your Excellency. Uh, this January uh, at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi, uh, His Excellency gave us some uh, terrific insight into the UAE's plans uh, to meet projected growth in energy and electricity demand through nuclear power. Uh, he discussed the origins of the UAE's pursuit of nuclear energy back in 2008, we'll come back to that in a moment, and efforts to uphold the highest international safety, security, and non-proliferation standards. Uh, the UAE has come a long way in realizing, realizing its potential, nuclear potential since 2008, and even since January of this year when we met in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the country has passed a historic milestone on February 7th, so, sorry, February 17th, a historic date, uh, when its federal authority of nuclear re regulation granted the nuclear operator, Nawa Energy, clearance to begin commercial operations at the first reactor of the Baraka nuclear energy plant in Abu Dhabi. The fuel load for Baraka 1 was completed at the beginning of March, so uh, congratulations, sir. Thank you. The UAE's energy sector diversification is particularly relevant now as uh, electricity sector resilience is being tested by the coronavirus pandemic. However, the UAE's clean energy sector has thrived uh, despite the threat to global supply chains. Late last month, Abu Dhabi Power Corporation granted a winning bid for a two gigawatt solar project and the UAE's nuclear regulator, and this is really interesting, nuclear regulator has been working with healthcare authorities to use radiation technology to diagnose and monitor COVID-19. And I hope we'll come back to that. Uh, the UAE has positioned itself to weather volatility in the energy and electricity sectors through its pursuit of clean energy and deployment of nuclear technology. Few are better suited than His Excellency uh, to discuss the UAE's efforts to maintain resilience and decarbonize the energy sector simultaneously. We look forward to hearing from you, sir, about the continued progress at Baraka Nuclear Energy Plant and the future role it will play. Now, before we be begin, as this event is uh, entirely virtual, if you are interested in asking questions during the question and answer period, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom uh, of your screen. Uh, and with that, uh, I now am going to welcome uh, His Excellency to our discussions. Uh, and I think I'll call you uh, also Mohammed during this conversation as we sure. it. Thank you. Uh, it's rare to have an opportunity like this for this um, uh, global audience to talk to someone who was literally there from the beginning in 2008. And I wonder if before we can dive before we dive in issues that are COVID related, perhaps you can give us a little bit of that history. What prompted this decision on part of UAE, and what has the experience been of the last uh, sorry the last ten years that got us to where we are uh, today? Okay. Uh, thank you, Fred, and thanks to Atlantic Council for having me, and also thank the viewers for uh, for their interest uh, about the UAE nuclear program. And I trust everyone is keeping safe and uh, these difficult times. And also, I would like to uh, convey a message of, care of, of support for those who've been affected uh, by the COVID-19. It, it is a serious crisis and a pandemic that hit the world and all of a sudden with it. Uh, 
a major black swan. So I would uh, recommend that, uh, you know, personally for everyone to follow the direction of the health authorities at all times and make sure that they keep themselves first safe and their family and colleagues uh, safe at these uh, difficult times that will will be there for quite some time. So back to your question, uh, Fred, about uh, UAE. Uh, so if, if I take you back on time and uh, talk about why did the UAE as a rich oil country go and, and, and pursue other sources of energy? So in 2007, we did a very comprehensive energy study to evaluate all the options. We looked at renewable, coal, uh, also, we have fossil fuels, specifically gas, uh, crude oil, and you name it. You know, all sources of energy. We've evaluated them, and we came up with the conclusion that we, after living, reviewing all those options, is that we needed uh, something that's sustainable, that's something that's clean, and will be there for the sustainability and uh, growth of the nation for decades to come. New renewable came as an option, and uh, we immediately pursued that. We have the UAE established uh, Abu Dhabi specifically established master. And Master now owns locally, internationally, uh, over six, seven gigawatts of, uh, of uh, renewable energy. Looking at the nuclear, as you mentioned earlier, in 2008, the UAE published its uh, policy paper. And the policy paper have set a clear principles of what the UAE is committed to. We are committed to the high standards of non-proliferation, nuclear safety, transparency, nuclear security, uh, to the highest standards. And we've uh, put that, uh, the government launched that in April 2008. Uh, to the world, and uh, that document states that we were evaluating if we will go with nuclear, we will implement these principles. Now, uh, fast forward 2019, uh, we managed to get the uh, project launched, and uh, we managed to, sorry, just a second. Uh, we managed to uh, get the uh, project up and running. We have today uh, four units uh, under construction. To be specific, uh, the first one is now construction has been completed. We've uh, started the testing for unit two, three, and four. And just a couple of months ago, we've removed the last crane, uh, polo crane at Baraka, at the at the fourth unit, and that uh, shows the construction, also completion of the of the all the major major equipment installation. So as we speak right now, the four units are. Uh, and their testing commissioning, and the most advanced one is uh, Unit One. And uh, you know we are really proud of the of the team there in Baraka. As of today, we have over 800 people now working, and they've been there for the last uh, six weeks, uh, working day and night to get the project on the right, uh, continue it on the right track, to make sure the power plants are uh, tested uh, to the safety standard we've set in 2008. And as you mentioned, uh, Unit One, uh, which is uh, our operating subsidiary in one energy company, got the license recently by our regulator, the Federal Authority for Nuclear Regulation, to uh, load fuel and fuel have been loaded and we are in advanced stages of stopping Unit One. Uh, th thank you very much, sir. Um, <clears throat> let me ask another, again, before we get into more details, uh, a big and broad question. Since you've been part of the history over the last 10 years, how would you look at the next 10 years? Uh, so what is success for you as you have built this? What does success for you look like 10 years from now in terms of the load it's carrying, in terms of what uh, what it may have inspired elsewhere in, in the UAE? Any, any uh, manner in which you'd like to address this, I think is just interesting because you've experienced such change in 10 years, what might we experience over the next decade? Yeah. That's a great question, Fred. Before I talk about the future, let me talk about also a bit of history and more detailed manner. So when we started the program, we did set up a very robust and a very uh, programmatic uh, guidelines on how we'll do this project. We developed a document called Roadmap. And the Roadmap takes all the principles of the uh, policy paper and put that into uh, activities, actions, commitment, legislations, bylaws that need to be uh, pub committed by the government with the IEA and other also also other nations like the one to three agreement with the US and translate that into actions. So looking back, I've been in this job for over years now and looking back it sounds it feels like a, it's very quick but there's a lot of work have been committed uh, in that in those years. So looking to, to you know, eleven years back, we planned the what we will do. 
we've did a, a great job and a fantastic job in implementing everything we've said that we will implement in the in the last uh, one, one decade. And today we have the units ready to operate, and uh, we are in advanced stages of operating them. Looking forward in the future, this industry have introduced something new to the nation, a new source of energy that uh, requires very rigorous standards and high level of management skills to, to for it to be constructed and operated for the next 60 years. Uh, did upgrade, I would say, a lot of infrastructure within the country to be able to, to be able to sustain that. You know, you mentioned our regulator, the FANR, Federal Authority of Nuclear Regulation. They are a competent regulator today. They are regulating our business and the utility sector. And also they regulate uh, healthcare and any radioactive material uh, that's been used for the oil and gas and, and, and others. So we have a very competent, very uh, robust and competent regulator. Looking at where the nuclear program uh, will be, once we operate the four units, Fred, these units will operate, uh, will provide around 25% uh, of electricity for the nation. And that's a major shift for the, for the UA energy mix. We've been dependent on fossil fuel. We'll continue also in the future, but nuclear will provide uh, clean, secure, and sustainable uh, source of energy. So 25% of electricity will be from nuclear once we have the four units up and running. And also that will avoid us emitting CO2 emissions of around 21 million tons on an annual basis. Just to put uh, this uh, perspective for the viewers here on this uh, webinar, that's around uh, 3.2 million cars off the road. And that's almost all the cars in, in the UAE as we speak today. We have roughly around 3, 3 million plus cars on the road. So the transportation sector emissions will be avoided by this four units once they become operational. So these, these are major uh, trends that will uh, put the UAE in the forefront as a cleaner, uh, a cleaner source of electricity for the nation. And also will create also a very highly paid jobs that young Emiratis who have been now by in the, not in, anymore in the hundreds, actually in the, in the, in the thousands by now, who are qualified in a very high tech industry and that demand a lot of knowledge and expertise in a very specialized area. And those guys, they will be uh, the future for the nation to do, to construct and operate any complex uh, require facilities for the nation. Well, I'm very proud of them personally. I know all, almost all of them by name at the 1000 plus, but the the guys who are in the control room or are, as, as we speak right now, they are in the power plant working 12 hour shift to operate the power plant safely. Another, uh, another angle I would also I'd like to highlight, it will also generate a new uh, private sector jobs to create, require new supply chain. Uh, as you know, UAE is uh, very heavy on the oil and gas. And there's a lot of companies from uh, Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, and you name it, the big companies are all in the UAE here working for the oil and gas business. And this is nuclear industry, just one level up and higher level from quality and standard, but they are the same uh, requirements of valves and pipes and mechanical equipment. So a lot of those companies who are here already in the country, once they upgrade them, themselves to the NQA1, the ANSI standard quality management, which required by the nuclear industry, will be very capable uh, to operate and, and help us and the journey of the next 60 years to operate these power plants in a sustainable and safe manner. Um, thank you. That's really powerful stuff. <clears throat> so 25% of uh, UAE's electricity needs covered when the four units are up. Uh, the equivalent in terms of uh, cleaning the air of 3.2 uh, million, did you say, cars off the road? Yes. Wow. That, I mean, that's really stunning. Um, and, and then, of course, adding the highly paid jobs, adding uh, new supply chain, new private sector jobs, that's all a very uh, positive picture. Um, uh, I, I, we're getting, we have some uh, real expertise on the line, so I see questions already coming in. Let me get through a couple more of my own, but I may interest some of the other questions as well. So let's talk about COVID-19. <clears throat> um, I've been talking to many CEOs, not in your sector, but uh, across other business areas, and everyone knows that we're not going back to the way things were before, but they're not entirely sure what the model is going forward, and everyone is influenced in one way or another. Um, and so, uh, and, they, and they talk a lot about not just surviving through COVID-19, but 
thriving and seeing uh, what the post-COVID-19 world could look like. I wonder if you could talk about the impact that COVID-19 has had on your project. Uh, what are the main actions you're taking to progress uh, with COVID-19 associated risks? I know the UAE has been out front on this and has done quite well. But furthermore, how has it affected uh, your, uh, the delivery of your first unit and the, and the timeline uh, for the remaining three reactors? So I, I, obviously precision in this world isn't always uh, possible, but when do we get to that 25% that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, Fred. You know, and if you allow me just to, you know, for the sake of the audience, to put things in perspective, so the COVID-19 from a 50,000 feet, you know, this is the deepest financial and economic shock that, uh, that hit the world in the last 100 years, I would say. And it is so quick, you know, within five weeks, it managed to change the whole world. You know, billions of people were, you know, almost in a standstill. And, you know, just to give an example in the US, you know, 30 million people just lost their jobs in, in, in five weeks. So the economic uh, economies have been hit hard. Uh, and from a business perspective point of view, now just you know myself being in the driver's seat of, of managing this uh, enterprise, I would say it it created uh, uncertainty. And I tell you I personally, and I'm sure a lot of people all over the world also had sleepless nights in the first couple of days. You know, your head uh, spinning, you were hit with the biggest swag, black swan ever that uh, been seen. So you were driving on the highway, you know, cruising with. Uh, and the speed limit in your journey to get the job done. And all of a sudden, that all of a sudden you had to shift to uh, with a delta of uncertainty that you still don't know what is that delta. Uh, from a people impact point of view, supply chain, economy, you name it, you know, it's a, it's a multifaceted crisis and a pandemic. So if I, well, first of all, I'll talk about people and the impact on, on Baraka. So, Immediately when when the, this uh, pandemic started, I'm very thankful to the, the leadership of the UAE at, uh, at federal level and uh, spearheaded by the leadership. They immediately took people as a top priority. So they said, just let's pause. Let's evaluate the situation we are in right now. And I remember a majlis by His Highness Sheikh Ahmed bin Zayed, where he spoke publicly and very transparently to the people what we know about this pandemic. And he said, we will guarantee supply chain, we'll guarantee food, we'll guarantee everything's flowing through the nation. And your personal protection and your safety is, is a paramount priority for us. So uh, stay at home, do your work, whatever you can do from home and get work done. So that immediately a message was to me to go and look at the, at the facilities, we ass we assessed the situation where we were we were in right now at the, you know seven weeks ago, uh, we did stop all the non essential work at Baraka. So we did demobilize people from from head office to ninety almost hundred percent. Everybody is working from home. Then we looked at the construction side. Priority number one is to keep people safe and keep COVID nineteen out of Baraka. And that was the ultimate goal. Nothing else. So we have a lot of heroes, I would say, in Baraka who committed to stay the time there and get the work done in a very systematic approach. You know, the nuclear guys in their DNA, they are very conservative. So whatever you tell them, they will do it in a very systematic approach and they will take the uh, safety, nuclear safety, and nu nuclear safety is, is a paramount of importance for us in the program. And this was actually a testimony to see how our people would behave. And they immediately behaved with the right behavior to lock down the site, demobilize the non-critical resources, and continue to get their, heads, they get their heads down and get the work done. So we've, we've observed the facility. Anybody leaves, Baraka, they're not allowed to come back to make sure that no uh, introduction of the virus to the, to the Baraka site. Then we observed almost on a daily basis, myself and the leadership team of the, uh, of the enterprise, we were meeting on a daily basis every day morning from 9 uh, to 10, and we'll, we'll talk as long as it takes. We were we making decisions on the spot to get things done to protect the safety of our people at the construction site. So the good news I have today, we don't have a single uh, positive case at the construction site, and that's I'm, I'm very proud and very uh, 
uh, proud of the team and how they've reacted. We started the process of testing the people to make sure there is no COVID-19. And you know, this virus is very contagious and can uh, get, you know, kind of a spread with, between people unknowingly. So the we did the right thing, as I said, by the social distance, by by not allowing people to come to Baraka for, quite, for a few weeks until we uh, guarantee that Baraka is uh, free of the COVID-19. We have also uh, learned from the Koreans, frankly, they've been, uh, there's a case study now, even in Korea as a nation, they took this crisis uh, heads on and they've been very uh, helpful to us. We've also engaged with WANO and also with the IEA to learn from other nations what they've done. And we also we managed to learn uh, to share our lessons with, 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 uh, with, with WANO, uh, our case study of how we've uh, did over, uh, I would not say overcome yet, but how we managed the crisis we were, we were hit with. As I said, I had sleepless nights to, to be able to uh, to put the plans together. And today, uh, the guys are, the team at site, uh, they are doing their work. But as you know, this crisis won't go away soon. Uh, everybody is aware of it. It's, it's a 12 months to 18 months if we are optimistic even. So we'll have to get to, uh, used to the new norm of working with this uh, COVID-19 and make sure the business and the facilities are safe from this uh, pandemic. Uh, as I said earlier, why social distance, we've installed disinfection uh, terminals. We have started even recently even doing the uh, sewage treat the, the sewage water uh, testing. So to find if there's any traces of, of COVID-19. Uh, of COVID and that gives you a, like a, you know, a sampling of the whole population you have if, if there is any infection or spread of COVID-19. Uh, COVID there's a lot of innovative also tools coming up to uh, screen people. So they come up. So uh, new tools will come definitely to, and we'll have to adopt them as fast as possible to make sure we go back to business, not with the back to normal, but to adapt with the, with the new norms. Thank, thank you so much for that very thorough answer, Mohammed. The, um, uh, uh, it, it's also very interesting. I had a conversation with um, your, uh, the UAE's AI minister a couple of weeks ago and I think you're probably in the same situation you were then, if not even further ahead, which is um, uh, per capita the highest testing rate in the world at the moment. Um, and and uh, also that you're uh, producing the tests uh, domestically as well and, and exporting to others. So that's not our topic for the day, but I think for people listening in, that's an interesting fact many of them might not know. Um, <clears throat> a good follow-up question, uh, and we're getting actually uh, several people asking this online, so it, it really fits into where we are in our conversation right now. Uh, so several audience members are wondering when Baraka One will provide power to the grid. When do you expect that to happen? And if COVID-19 uh, has delayed this or will delay yeah. it? Yeah, so so today, you know, we are on, on schedule. Uh, the, just uh, two a week and a half ago, we went what we call from the nuclear, you know, from mode five to mode four. And that's uh, on critical path to get the job done. So we are continuing with our plan. And uh, we will definitely keep safety as an overriding priority. And we will not. We will always continue to do this uh, business in a safe manner. And the current uh, impact we have right now uh, did not derail us from our plans. We, can, we are continuing with our critical path. And uh, Unit 1 has a plan. Uh, we are planning to go critical uh, very soon. Uh, you know, in, in, in a couple of weeks or a month or so from now, and we are targeting uh, to get the units operational and start put, you know, putting power to the grid uh, before the year. So that's uh, the plan is not uh, not impacted yet. But as you know, this uncertainty of this COVID nineteen is still there, and uh, it's the, the the biggest blackest one that ever we've ever uh, the humanity have seen uh, from a speed of impact. Uh, so we just you know when when it comes to people. We manage, by the way, also now to get people back in, in, the, in, the, in, the construction, in the construction side and also the operational side. We managed to flew a couple of uh, senior guys from the U.S. recently, and they just finished their quarantine this morning. I'm very happy to, to have them in Baraka. We managed to bring around 120 uh, people. But the new norm now, we have to bring them to the country. They sit in quarantine for, for 14 days. They get tested twice within those 14 days, and they're not allowed to go to, to the site. So... We overcome now this uh, hurdle of uh, access of people to site. I don't see any supply chain challenges uh, so far because we have all the equipment, all the material have been at site. 
And the good thing also, when you build four units, you have four, uh, you have three uh, redundancies. So for whatever we need unit for unit one, we can still take it from unit two, three, and four. We don't have any issues right now, but if we need it, we still have the other three units to cannibalize, I would say, to make sure that the first unit is operational. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the work we've done so far. We're on critical path. We will maintain that uh, path, but safety will continue to be our overriding priority. And we've done that from the get-go, from the early days of the project. As I mentioned, 2008, in our policy, we've committed to the highest standard of nuclear safety. And that translated throughout all the work we do. And again, looking at this uh, crisis and pandemic which happened in Baraka, I'm really proud of the reaction of our team. They really did stood up to the uh, test and their DNA of the nuclear culture to, to take the high standards and implement them in a very fast and systematic manner was a true testimony of our uh, success of having the right culture to be ready to operate the power plants. And thank you for that. And, and very powerfully put, the biggest blackest uh, swan uh, one can imagine. Um, <clears throat> and so let's get to that, which is throughout the world, we're seeing the effects of COVID-19 on electricity demand. Um, uh, you are uh, luckily not in the job where you have to uh, talk about oil production and oil prices, so I'm not going to ask you. But I do uh, wonder what the lessons we have learned from COVID-19 for the power sector in the UAE, and maybe largely, so looking first at the power sector of the UAE, but then do you think COVID-19 in a uh, global sense will disrupt uh, what we've been calling the progress of the energy transition? So with the COVID-19 impact you know I, I this is my you know area of expertise or my area of interest uh, electricity electrification electricity demand electricity consumption and how a grid operates that's an area of, of my interest and i'm observing what's happening in the world and the statistics and number that have been published globally we've seen when the the uh, covid 19 started there's almost like three weeks of when people go to quarantine then they go back to quarantine for two to one two three weeks then you see kind of uptick in the in the demand. So globally, power demand went down, electricity demand, sorry, went down from 10 to 20%. In certain countries like Italy and Spain went even to 25%, you know, drop. But then gradually went uh, up again. The good news, the positive side of the electricity is that it is the backbone for, for the world to continue working. We saw oil demand went up and down, but electricity, we didn't see any blackout anywhere in the world. That's a good news and shows the resilience of those grids. And this electricity is a reliable and a backbone for nations to uh, to overcome uh, the you know the good time and the bad times. And also, we've seen uptick actually unusual uh, uptick uh, when people now stay at home. There is more consumption per 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 uh, per capita. You know, I have six kids at home, so. Each one has their own one or two gadgets, plus an Apple TV, plus some IP TV that they are, you know, operating with. They are schooling at home, and you know, my uh, router is always overheating. And you see that it, it is <laughs> energy consumption is high at home, and this is when you multiply it to the world, uh, it is uh, an increase per per capita. Just to give you another figures, you know, which has been published. For example, the subscription to Netflix. Netflix saw an uptick of around 15 million. A subscriber just in the last couple of weeks and now actually netflix have over worth is even beyond exxon they overtook exxon from a value point of view and and these are you know changes are happening and uh, these will be will continue with us when we go back even even after 18 months if we go back to the new normal covid 19 these trends are are showing up another fact I've also i've been very interested to look at is is the data centers, you know, just data centers, they consume around 400 watts per uh, per square uh, square meter and a, an estimated of around 8.9 billion kilowatt uh, more, an uptick of electricity, electricity consumption because of the higher use of cloud computing globally. So the, the long story short, the electricity sector is a, a resilient sector and it's designed in a way that continuously and securely providing electricity. That's why people don't know it. People don't even know it's, it exists because it's always there and it's always uh, uh, providing uh, you know sources of energy. And the uh, COVID-19 did show that uh, it, it is 
uh, a reliable source of, of energy. Another, I would add to, add, to, add to that also, electrification is growing fastly. The IEA recently published a report showing that electricity is the fastest growing uh, energy source for the for the world. And then looking at the UAE model, you know, in UAE, when we looked, as I mentioned earlier, in 2007, and we assessed how the future of the UAE will look like, you know, in 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 years down the road, we did look at electricity as one of the definitely key sources of, of energy for the country. And that's why we looked at nuclear, we looked at renewable, with a clear mind and clear mindset to have a sustainable, secure, and reliable and clean source of energy. So building four units that will provide around 25% of electricity for the nation, that will avoid around 21 million tons of CO2 emissions, it, you know, check that box for us from an energy uh, security, uh, energy uh, electricity in a clean manner, and also energy security, which is sometimes when you look at the private sector, they don't look at that. But governments like, you know, like we are in the UAE, here, we look at that. We, we do value energy security. And when you have this crisis like uh, this COVID-19, it's a good test to, uh, to have a reliable grid that have your country up and running in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sustainable manner. Um, fab, 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 fascinating, uh, fascinating answer. Um, uh, so you have uh, six children eating into the electricity, into the grid. I have just one. If I multiplied that by six, I can assure you, sir, that our bandwidth would be blown, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. This is a period like no other. <clears throat> uh, so given your expertise in, in electricity systems and delivering of electricity, I'd like to talk to you about the ambitious plan the UAE has for decarbonizing its electricity system. And, and just for people listening in, the whole notion in, uh, uh, in the GCC um, and, and uh, oil producing countries of decarbonizing the electricity system so completely is, is a new concept, but it's moving so fast. Um, and uh, that includes for you the world's largest concentrated solar power plant. It includes for you carbon capture utilization and storage programs. Uh, and it includes for you the region's uh, first hydrogen plant. So what special role with this mix does nuclear energy fill uh, in this generation mix? And, and so that's first question. Second question, does COVID-19 influence this? Does, does it have an impact on, on this in, in one way or another? Yeah. So... Uh Fred, that's a great, a great question. If you allow me just to also go at like 50,000 people before, before I go into detail. So looking at the electricity sector, and, and this is also a very information, it's dear to my heart because there's always a misunderstanding and misinterpretation of how electricity is made and what's the best way to make electricity. So looking at the UAE, UAE has been, a, I think I would say, a pioneer in a, a cleaner sources of energy. Recently, we just, the government published the opening of a new tender for a PV plant, which is uh, the cheapest in the world. It's around 1.35 1 cent, 1 cents per kilowatt, and that's the cheapest anywhere in the world, and it's over a giga plus uh, plant. But we need to look at things in a, in a perspective of, of the energy density. So what's powering the world and but the main key driver for the world and the current economy we, we, we are enjoying today has been fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is in our, you know, as I was in our fertilizer, you know, in steel and plastics, you name it, in all sectors, you know, the coal, uh, cement, air, airplanes, and all that. So, and why is that? You know, why oil has, has been a critical for our success globally and, and will continue to be there for, for, for a long time. Uh, uh, because of one simple factor, because of energy density, one, and because of transportability, you can transport oil easily. You could put it in a, or use a, you know, like a bottle here, and and that, if you look at energy density of of oil, it's around fourteen thousand watt per kilogram. So if you, it's a fourteen thousand watt is stored in one kilogram of, uh, of of that matter. If you look at uh, PV, it's around 120 to 200 watt 
per kilogram. So you go from 14,000 to 150 to 200 watt per kilogram. That's very low uh, density. And if you look at batteries, by example, for example, it, it, if you get like, the best batteries, the most expensive one, which is in the Tesla cars, they are at 250 watt per kilogram. So that energy density is, is the best, is the, is the most complex and most challenging for our electricity and for energy transfer. So to, to summarize that long story I just explained, uh, nuclear energy density is around 325,000 watt per kilogram. So it's a very dense, very dense energy and can provide 24 seven base load electricity for almost 18 months, almost to 24 months even with, with, with the same technology we have right now. So why nuclear is important of the energy mix and why, you know, as electrical engineer for, of, you know, in, in my job for 20 years, I love this technology because it provides a clean, secure, and reliable source of energy coupled with definitely will have it we, we, in that base load you will have gas plants you will have renew, nuclear so renewable or photovoltaic or when they will come in and out as intermittent but we will not be able to enjoy that cheap uh, uh, pv unless we address the and solve the the battery issue as i said batteries today uh, the best of best of them can store uh, from energy density can go up to 250 watt per kilogram. Even the batteries, which is now in the advanced stages of R&D, they run from 350 to 400 watt per kilogram. Going back, just I want to repeat the numbers because you know I've been speaking fast. I'll slow down. I do apologize. Uh, it's 14,000 watt per kilogram for uh, for diesel, and 250 for batteries. And nuclear is 300, 325,000 per watt, uh, watt per kilogram. So going back, how we can secure the future with a diversified portfolio of energy. UAE did this in a very systematic approach and a very thorough uh, approach. And we developed a basket of energies. We have renewable, we'll have uh, nuclear, we'll continue to use gas uh, for, the, for, the time, for the time being. We are looking at, as you mentioned, uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, because that's uh, also uh, the energy density of hydrogen. It's, it's roughly around uh, 39,000 uh, per 39,000 watt per uh, per gram per kilogram, and that's also a, a bit uh, dense to store energy in. And we're looking at all options. And the good thing for the UE now we have the optionality to switch between uh, renewable, nuclear, and 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 fossil fuel. Because we have them in our basket, and they are, we are, will be using them for decades to come. So I'm, I'm personally very proud of, of what how our country have achieved from an energy policy point of view, and that shows the leadership commitment to put the right steps, put the right vision and strategy for the nation, and invest in that. Some people think uh, the global warming is not real. It is real. And the global warming is happening. And the UAE's actions to eliminate three to, to eliminate the whole transportation sector from carbon emissions on an annual basis, the serious commitment that the UAE made. And these are uh, billions of, of, of dollars investments, by the way. It's not a small investment, it's, it's a major investment, coupled with the renewable and coupled coupled with the investing in the grid to make this grid reliable and secure for the nation. And that's all far sight. Energy sector, PC sector, Fred, when you invest in it, you don't invest for a couple of years. You invest for 30 years plus. Investment in nuclear is a 60 years plus investment. Uh, what, what, a, what a powerful answer. So uh, when people ask me, why, does the, why is the global, I'm uh, sorry, why is the Atlantic Council's global energy form in Abu Dhabi every year at the beginning of Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week? I'm going to play them back your answer that you just gave. That's the reason. That's where the mix is. That's where the mixture of sources comes from uh, and all of the above kind of scenario. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, to a lot of uh, audience questions right now, uh, following up to a certain extent our conversation right then, which is a uh, question here is in the winter, when electricity demand is less in the UAE, are there plans to export 
electricity to absorb surplus low carbon electricity? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the grid in the UAE today, it's a fully integrated, fully interconnected grid that can export uh, gigawatts back and forth in the grid. The good news also have for our viewers here today that the GCC 20 years ago thought about connecting the GCC grid of a 400 kV, also equivalent of transporting uh, gigawatt plus in the grid of the GCC. That was done and for energy security purposes. If a country needs more energy or less energy for crisis, that they, they you know, kind of a, will exchange that power. And it's been happening for the last uh, good numbers of years. Now we've been exchanging power between UAE, Saudi, Kuwait, and, and, and the rest of the GCC. And that's been uh, a, great, a fantastic project, which is the GCC have invested in. I do see a future uh, trading in that grid because it's there, it's been invested in and uh, we've been exchanging electricity in that grid that will create a huge market for exchange between the gcc grid as you know the gcc grid every nation has its own policy and strategy when it comes uh, to energy mix some nation has different portfolio of energies uh, some are based on crude oil burning some of it based on on other alternative source of energy the uae has been pioneering in the, cl the cleaner sources of energy just to look at, at the region here UAE had installed 80% of the renewable energy in the region, by the way. 80% have been installed by the UAE in the last 10 years. And that's a, a, a dramatic also change in the energy mix. So I do see opportunity of exchange of electricity. And also I do see an opportunity of even beyond the, the GCC of electricity exchange. Uh, if you look at the you know pan-Arabian, pan-Arabic area and also beyond the Arab uh, Arab world, there is a huge opportunity between winter and summer. Even the daily shift, by the way, by the hourly from east to west, between the hourly shift of uh, peak of, of electricity demand, there is also an exchange power. And it's happening as we have here in the GCC grid. So definitely there is a huge market and a huge also for the transmission distribution companies to invest on automation of a grid here in the region. So whomever is, and this call is from the uh, uh, private sector looking to invest grid automation, grid reinforcement will be required in the, the next 10 years plus to be able to allow that power to flow, that energy to flow uh, in the region. I do, if you ask me what will be a, a, a beautiful and interesting project to see in the region is to have that bottlenecks and that interconnection in the GC and the, in the Arab world and beyond the Arab world, even to Europe and beyond and Africa to be able to exchange that uh, the power uh, throughout the region as um, I'm sure you're, you're the, the person who asked the question is aware of the, the swing between in winter and summer of electricity we have because of the heavy air conditioning we do in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in summertime, that will, will have a lot of uh, good, clean energy that could be shared in the region. Ter terrific answer. Um, so we'll come back to the regional question. Uh, there are uh, uh, two or three that questions go in that direction, uh, but one more on the COVID impact. And that's on the question of energy transitions globally. Uh, we were heading to, uh, to a certain extent, to a potential acceleration of energy transitions to lower carbon and cleaner. Uh, you could also imagine with uh, fossil fuel prices dropping so low that that could get in the way of that transition. What is your view on, on how COVID is going to impact energy transitions globally? Yeah. So... If I give you the, the UAE view on this, you know, from UAE, in the UAE side, we, we plan our energy uh, plans for the next 20, 15 to 20 years plus. And as I said, investing in the electricity sector specifically, you invest for decades plus uh, when it comes to, uh, to electricity demand. I, I do foresee there is some uh, shift maybe globally will happen for other markets, but for the UAE, we are on a mission. We are very focused to create uh, clean and secure sources of electricity for the nation. And that uh, policy was published in 2008, and uh, we, pursue, we, are, we are pursuing it, and we continue pursuing it with a focus of diversifying our energy portfolio with a cleaner source as a, as a, as a priority for us. And also energy security also will continue to play a major role in our energy planning and energy forecast for the future. As I said, 
we are not talking about it today. We, we've been doing it. You know, we've, we've, we've done a uh, major investment in this sector in the last 10 years. As I mentioned earlier, we've installed 80% of uh, renewable energy in the, in the region here. We've installed uh, 5.6 gigawatt of, 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 of nuclear power plants in the UAE. And we'll bear the fruit of that investment very soon. And I look forward uh, to have uh, a cleaner energy mix uh, for the UAE that will uh, put the UAE in the forefront and leading in the uh, energy mix with a cleaner and secure uh, source of electricity for the nation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, once in a while, I want to throw in something uh, uh, personal here. So I just, I'm sending you a hello. Please say hello to Mohammed and wish him congratulations from Andy Kadak, formerly uh, at MIT. Happy to see such great progress. So that's a- Thank you, sir. Thank that's, you. That's the question. Uh -huh. um, so the UAE, this, uh, this, uh, this comes from Lightbridge CEO, Seth Gray. The UAE is, uh, is uh, clearly a leader on nuclear energy and energy in general. Can you discuss, discuss contacts with other countries seeking to learn from the UAE successes? Uh, you could say it would be great as part of a global effort to decarbonize. So um, for, uh, what is your answer to the Lightbridge CEO on contacts with other countries seeking to learn from the UAE successes? And I would add something to that. So countries in general, but I would also add, as you look around the region in the Middle East, where do you think the next movers will be in this region? This comes from another related question. Uh, and to what extent, uh, ask this questioner, uh, is uh, the UAE um, an exportable model? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, Fred, and thank you, thank you, Seth, for that question. Uh, the UAE, if I take you back in history, when we looked at the UAE, when we, the UAE published its paper in 2008, in April 2008, we had clear commitment to the highest standard of non proliferation the highest standard of energy security, the highest standard of uh, nuclear safety, nuclear quality. And we, we made that commitment uh, part of our DNA for the UAE. And I personally, myself and a couple of my colleagues went to the IEA. We've asked the IEA how we can develop a program from a white piece of paper and, and develop uh, something that will be sustainable for the nation. We've shared the, the policy paper with, with, with them and uh, even some colleagues like Seth Gray also were, were involved with us in the early days of this project. And uh, they gave us a couple of nations to evaluate. So we looked at Korea, uh, South Korea, and we looked at other nations to, to learn from. And we, we took a lot of best practice. The IEA have published a paper called the Milestones, the 19 Areas of Milestones to Develop uh, Civil Nuclear Power Plants for a Nation. Today, if you go and ask the IEA, they will go they will tell you go to the UAE and look at the model to develop a civilian uh, nuclear power, uh, power plant and program for a nation to do it in a best standards and best practices. Um, from our commitment to our policy paper that was issued in 2008, transparency was, uh, was key in our uh, principles and our DNA. So we've been very transparent in sharing all the lessons learned, all the best practices we have been implemented uh, our regulators is, is, is very vocal in sharing the lessons learned and benchmarking. The ENEC, the Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, we've been very engaging with the IEA. We've been very engaging with WANO to share our lessons learned. We are we are one of the highest reporting of lessons learned to the uh, to WANO, and I take personal pride in that because once we share the lessons learned, we will also learn from others, and people will come and knock on our door and give us what they've done. Uh, right and what they're wrong, so we don't repeat the the, the mistakes. So looking at the region, uh, any nation want to develop a sustainable nuclear, civil nuclear power plant, they are uh, very welcome to uh, to work with the UAE. The IEA has been our uh, protocol, our ambassador at the IEA, Ambassador Hamad Al Kabi, constantly connecting us through the IEA, uh, through nation, through other nations who are interested to build uh, the power plants. I uh, do attend every September, the General Assembly. We have a lot of workshops to share the UAE uh, commitment to non proliferation to commitment to how we build this to the highest standards for nuclear safety, security, and non proliferation So I, I cannot speculate on who are the nations who will develop nuclear power plants, but the UAE managed to do this in a 
in a sustainable and successful manner. I think we've paved the way for others to do this in a, in a you know, in a more efficient and effective way. I'm sure our we made few mistakes at, along the way. Well, we would we'll definitely share them, and we've been sharing them with the IEA, so that our colleagues and any nations could could learn from that. What I would encourage, you know, Fred uh, companies to come to the UAE here. As I mentioned earlier, we have heavy, intense oil and gas industry here. A lot of companies are already, you know, they have shops here in the UAE. Since the UAE is a leading in the region in the nuclear industry, it will be great for them to upgrade their standards of nuclear to nuclear standards. And we've adopted the American NUQA1. It's an ANSI standard. Uh, I'm sure a lot of American companies are familiar with that standard to be able to upgrade themselves and help us in the operation of, and the maintenance of those power plants. The supply chain, uh, I spoke about earlier, will require companies from valve, pipes, you name it, uh, instrumentation, control, to help us in this uh, sustainability of operating these power plants. This industry, by the way, Fred, will be in multi-billion dollars industry over the next 60 years. So I do encourage companies to be bullish, to come to the UAE and set up shops here. This is the future for nuclear industry in the region. And we are very supportive to help them uh, set up shops. We are help uh, to help them also to connect them with the local companies to be able to work with them. We've set up workshops and uh, with workshops, uh, thanks to you at the Atlantic Council. We've set also with the UAE US uh, Business Council and many other also with NEI to invite companies to come here to the UAE and, and work with us. So I, I take this opportunity. We have uh, 100 people in this call. Uh, this webinar to uh, to come and and connect with us and understand the business opportunities that will be there for uh, for decades to come. Thank you for that very rich answer. Uh, we're we're down to our last few minutes. Let me go to a question from our friend Jane Nakano, uh, and it's just so impressive the level of expertise we have on this webinar. Uh, uh, her question: What is the effect? And this is totally related to what you just said. What is the effect of COVID-induced economic slowdown on the projected growth of nuclear power generation programs across the Middle East? For example, does it delay the growth due to fiscal challenges in major regional countries face, or does it facilitate the growth of nuclear as an additional energy source as the world has witnessed extreme volatility in oil prices? So how is that gonna play out in that general sense and then another question in the specific sense uh, goes back to the question of whether COVID-19 accelerates changes in the UAE energy mix uh, and deployment of clean energy, or does it leave things sort of unchanged? So uh, in, in, in the first question is clear from Jane Nakano, and then the second related question. Yeah, so uh, thank you for this uh, great question. I cannot comment on oil and gas. I'm not an expert on oil and gas. But what I, comment, what I could comment on is the electricity sector. I assure you, the electricity sector will continue to grow. Electrification globally will continue to grow. Uh, the demand for electricity will continue to grow. Uh, as I said, you know, the consumption per capita, consumption per, uh, per individual globally is getting more and more. You know, I was, I was raised in the uh, you know, 70s, 80s, and we had uh, you know, very limited gadgets at home. Today, there's a lot of gadgets available at home. I, as I said earlier, I have six kids, and each of one, each one of them has a laptop, an iPhone, or or a, or a, or a mobile device, and, and some other other devices that they're using. So, electricity demand and electrification will grow. Don't no doubt about no doubt about it. Uh, maybe some heavy industries will 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 consume less. But if you look at Asia today, between India and, and China, there's a huge electricity demand is growing up. The UAE had in 2008, 9, and 10, 11, and 12, double digits of electricity growth. We are still in the four and five of uh, efficiency demand growth on an annual basis, by the way. So I, I don't see COVID-19 will, will, will have any major impact. It will, might be some kind of uh, impact on uh, some other nations, but for the UAE, UAE is committed to its energy policy. Our program, and construction is continuing as uh, as we speak, and we will continue developing this uh, program. We will continue to invest in our cleaner and more secure energy portfolio. Uh, the UAE program, I, I've been in this job, as I said, for 11 years, and I've seen the financial crisis of 2008. I lived through that. 
I've seen many crises, many crises in the last 11 years. This is a major one, but uh, for our program today, we are we finished construction, which is the major uh, hurdle of expenditure. We are just now start in the process of starting the units, so I don't see any major impact for our program. And the UAE, as I said, we just reopened recent uh, this uh, tender or the bid for this uh, new uh, photovoltaic plant over a gigawatt, and the bids we received for 1.35 cents. It is amazing to see that prices, and that will make uh, the electricity mix for the nation uh, continue to grow. Again, you know, uh, to go back to the electrification, that's you know close to my heart, and I like talking about it. I could talk for hours about it. I know time is short. And I don't want to, you know, keep talking about it. But the, the future on electrification will continue. We will see more automation on, on the grid, and you will see a better ways and more efficient ways of electricity uh, for the future. We will see greener sources of energy. We will see uh, the world will be a better world, cleaner world with electrification. That's the, and we will continue with fossil fuel for many, many, many uses other than just uh, electricity making or gen generating electricity, petrochemicals and others will continue to be there for, for decades to come. Thank, thank you so much. So two quick closing questions. We're running out of time, uh, but one is a nice way also to end, uh, end the discussion. So the first is from uh, Cyril Molina. Um, and uh, uh, first of all, he says he hopes to see you at the World Nuclear Exhibition 2020 in December. Uh, but the question, so. is, uh, but the question, and this is goes to your point of inviting people to come to Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, does Enic intend to sell uh, consulting services to other countries which aim to start nuclear program? Mentioning that uh, as a successful nuclear newcomer, your consulting services could be quite valuable. And then I'd love to end uh, with a with a wonderful question that I, I, I love to talk, ask uh, CEOs who have succeeded anyway, uh, which is if you, uh, and this is from Jason Cameron, uh, looking back on the last 10 years, what lessons have you learned? And he puts it even nicer than that, says, what advice would your 2020 self give to your 2010 self? <laughs> I now with next question, even I, even I forgot the first question. So it, that was uh, the, the, the first the first question. question is whether e Enoch would go into consulting business. On, on, on yeah, but, uh, we won't compete with companies. Uh, and just to assure the, the, the audience here <laughs> and the viewers, uh, we we are focused on building nuclear power plants. We are you know we are focused on our mandate. We will definitely help anybody who wants to to develop civilian. Uh, nuclear uh, plants and you know and their nations and any also any other consultants who are interested to come and benchmark to to learn from what we've done please feel free to come and connect with us to to share with you we we want to we want the world to be better and see nuclear industry successful you know your country in the us been benefiting from this nuclear power plants for for for, for decades plus with a clean and source uh, and reliable source of energy and we see the uae uh, as a uae success story we can see this is, is, is achievable in a cost manner from economics point of view. It's achievable also from a time you know, schedule point of view. So we would love to share our lessons learned with the, with the future. So second question, that's a very interesting question. I would like to, you know, to reflect on that. What I will tell myself in 2008 uh, when I, I was given the job, uh, anyway, that question will need a lot of thinking and reflection, I would say. <laughs> but uh, the, the basic lessons learned, uh, I would say doing something today that I'm seeing the future, you know, if I go back and given the chance to rethink the, will I take this job or not? I will definitely do it because to be able to create a dent in, in the world uh, for the UAE specifically to generate uh, abundance of electricity and, 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 and be able to avoid 21 million tons of CO2 emissions. I've never had that in mind. I never even envisioned that when I when I took this job. So I would be proud of this in my uh, career. I would be proud of this for for uh, for decades to come. I'm sure my kids will be proud of it. And I'm sure the 3,000 employees we have in the company 
who are working day and night to make this happen, they will be proud because to be able to get a small dent in the environmental footprint, to be able to avoid 21 million tons of CO2 emissions in an annual basis is a massive achievement. I've, I've never thought about it, but when my daughter asked me, what do you do for a living? I've been telling her I build nuclear power plants. But one day she asked me, really, really, what do you do? What, what, what will happen after you finish your job and you complete those four units you've been talking about day and night, you know, about here at home? And I said, oh, I've created something that will avoid emitting 21 million tons of CO2 emissions. Her jaw just dropped. She's been avoiding to take the plastic bags to when she buy grocery. And she said, how does this compare to plastic bags? And I told her, she did her project, I think, you know, her senior design project for her high school. And she's baffled. She's, she's amazed with that uh, number. So I'm, I'm proud, personally, very, very proud. So uh, Your Excellency, I don't know how many plastic bags that is, but it's a lot of plastic bags. I'm going to, I, I, I am uh, uh, going to end, we're out of time, but I want to pass on a congratulatory message from Ambassador Graham. Uh, that I think speaks for many others on, on, on the line, including myself. So here it is. Congratulations to Your Excellency on your program's outstanding performance in the development of nuclear power and adherence to principle. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Thank you for this rich conversation. And, and thank you so, to so many people who participated from such a uh, uh, rich expert audience. So uh, Your Excellency, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Fred. Thank you, Sudan. Thank you, Ambassador Graham. Appreciate uh, your uh, kind message. I, the last message I would say, you know, let's let's make uh, the world a better world. Let's uh, see ways we can make a, a greener, a cleaner electricity. Let's be realistic also in our approach. Uh, there's a lot of sources available. There's a lot of work being done to make the, the, the world a better world in energy storage and, and, and you name it. But we have to be realistic in our approach and our uh, in our thinking. We have to be very practical and pragmatic in, in the solutions we 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 push and we we lobby for. Uh, last message I would say, you know, for for the audience and uh, the viewers, please stay safe, please stay healthy, uh, please implement the, uh, the the guidelines which is uh, then you know for implemented globally to stay safe. First of all, for yourself, keep your family safe. Keep the work environment safe. This is a serious pandemic and the world is suffering. And when we do one small bit of saving ourselves first, saving our family, saving our society, the, the, it will, will go a long way. And we need to fight this uh, COVID-19 all together as, as one team globally. And uh, we are seeing the, uh, the, the path getting uh, clearer for us. And let's, uh, let's be safe. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful ending. Let me just wish Ramadan Mubarak to you uh, and to everyone else uh, on, on the line. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Ramadan Karim to you all. Thanks. Thank you.